Here's a challenge for you. Try to find out where the T-Rex skull nicknamed Maximus is right now. You can't. Outside of the buyer's circle, no one knows. What is known is that in December of 2022, Sotheby's sold it for about $6.07 million, well below their $15 to $20 million estimate, and the buyer chose to remain anonymous. It's reportedly one of the most complete T-Rex skulls ever found, and now it's in a private collection. For scientists, that means access is no longer guaranteed, and the research it could fuel is on hold. To understand why this skull mattered so much, you have to go back to where it was found. In the far northwest corner of South Dakota, Harding County stretches out as a patchwork of rolling grasslands cut by dry creek beds, windswept ridges, and eroding buttes. It's quiet now, but in the late Cretaceous, this same ground was part of a humid river plain crawling with dinosaurs. For late Cretaceous dinosaur paleontologists, it's one of the richest hunting grounds on the continent. This is the Hell Creek Formation, the same geologic unit that produced Sioux and Stan, fossils that became both scientific touchstones and multi-million dollar auction pieces. So when fossil hunters prospecting on a remote ranch spotted the edge of a massive bone weathering out of the sediment in 2020, they had good reason to think they had just met the next motherlode. From the start, the skull made an impression. Some news outlets initially reported it was about 76 million years old, but Sotheby's catalog and geological consensus put the specimen firmly in the Maastrichtian Age Hell Creek Formation, about 67 million years ago, dating to the final few million years before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. This is exactly the right slice of time for Tyrannosaurus rex, and exactly the kind of deposit that's yielded the most complete specimens we know. Excavation unfolded over two field seasons, in 2020 and 2021, on private land. The site had been heavily eroded, and most of the post-cranial skeleton was long gone, reduced to a weathered scapula and around 160 scattered bone fragments. What survived was the skull, collected by experienced field workers before the same erosion could destroy it as well. That survival alone was remarkable. Wind, plants, geologic activity, water, and freeze-thaw cycles can disassemble a T-Rex skull in no time. The specimen's completeness made it stand out even more. Sotheby's listed it with 30 of the roughly 39 skull bones, present and original, articulated to an approximate length of 53.5 inches. 29 teeth were still in place, all from the same adult individual. The skull alone reportedly weighed about 160 pounds, although I don't know how much I believe that. Mounted on its stand, it rose to just under 6 feet 8 inches tall, and the whole assembly somehow topped 600 pounds. These weights make no sense, since fossils are made up of minerals and are therefore extremely heavy, even if not particularly massive. That level of integrity, especially after so much of the rest of the skeleton had been destroyed, is part of why Henry Galliano, Sotheby's natural history consultant, called it a great stroke of luck. For researchers, a skull like this is far more than an eye-catching trophy. It preserves details of jaw mechanics, tooth wear, and muscle attachment that reveal how T-Rex fed and how much force it could exert in a bite. Even without the rest of the skeleton, it captures signs of the animal's life history. Injuries, growth patterns, maybe even traces of disease. What could scientists have learned? Among the preserved details on the skull, two deep round openings stand out, symmetrical, cutting clean through solid bone. Sotheby's specialists describe them as consistent with high force bites, possibly from another T-Rex, and pointed to them as evidence for a violent encounter in life. But their own catalog also noted another possibility. Lesions like these can be caused by a trichomonas-like parasitic infection that eats away at bone from the inside. Both scenarios have precedent in the fossil record, and neither rules the other out entirely. 
If the marks were made by teeth, the measurements line up with the bite of a large tyrannosaur, the largest predator in the Hell Creek ecosystem, as far as we know. That would make it a case of face biting, the kind of head grappling behavior seen in other famous specimens. Stan, for example, has punctures through its skull that healed over, suggesting it survived a direct attack. Scotty, another giant T-Rex, carries similar healed facial injuries. Face wounds in these animals often cluster around the jaws, hinting at bouts over territory, food, or mates. On the other hand, if the circular holes are the result of disease, Maximus might be more in line with Black Beauty, whose jawbones show pitting consistent with a parasitic infection that would have made feeding difficult. What's certain is that Maximus's skull carries more than just these two openings. Sotheby's experts also described other possible bite marks, bone changes consistent with osteomyelitis, a serious infection, and even insect borings in some areas. The insect traces mean that after death, the carcass lay exposed long enough for scavengers to access it before burial. If the punctures came from a rival's bite, did the animal survive the attack only to have the wounds turn septic? If they were the work of parasites, did that infection weaken it enough for another predator to finish the job? Either way, the skeleton suggests a hard existence in which even an apex predator could end up injured, infected, and exposed. The presence of such pathologies reminds us that survival in the late Cretaceous wasn't just about hunting skill, it was about enduring what the environment, disease, and other predators could throw at you. All of these clues make Maximus more than just an impressive display piece. They hint at an individual life story, conflict, injury, resilience, and decline written into the bone. And yet, just as those stories seemed ready to enter the scientific record, events took a turn that would remove them from public view entirely. Maximus had all the makings of a star specimen, the sort of fossil that could end up in textbooks cited in papers for decades, maybe even displayed alongside Sue and Stan as one of the iconic tyrannosaurs. Instead, its future was decided not in a lab or a museum, but under the glare of an auction spotlight. Sotheby's billed it as one of the most complete T-Rex skulls ever found and gave it the kind of price range meant to signal extreme rarity, 15 to 20 million dollars. They went in with no reserve, meaning it would sell for whatever the highest bid landed at, no matter how low. That's not something you usually see with an object of this kind, and it gave the whole event a sense of experimentation as much as spectacle. The timing was strategic too. The market had already been primed by a couple of blockbuster sales. Sue's skeleton went for $8.3 million back in 1997, which at the time felt like science fiction. Then in 2020, Stan rewrote the record books at $31.8 million. Those figures generated headlines not only in science reporting but in mainstream news. Suddenly, dinosaur auctions were on the cultural radar. Sotheby's also leaned into the manageable angle. A full skeleton is the size of a bus and needs its own dedicated gallery space. A skull, though? As their head of science and popular culture pointed out, more people can fit a skull inside their home than a full dinosaur. That opens the bidding field well beyond institutions with cavernous exhibit halls. When bidding day arrived, the outcome caught people off guard. The hammer fell at $6.07 million, far below the low estimate. That's still a staggering sum for most objects, but in the auction world, it was a surprise. Hypotheses started flying. Maybe the fossil market was starting to cool after the frenzy of the past few years. Maybe it had to compete with other high-profile specimens on offer, eating into the buyer pool. Maybe the degree of completeness wasn't quite what some collectors wanted. Whatever the case, it didn't change the core fact that the sale was done, and Maximus now belonged to a private owner. That's where the long-running debate comes in. Museums rarely have the budget to outbid private collectors on major fossils, especially in this price range. Once a piece goes into a private collection, there's no guarantee it'll be available for study, display, or education. Even with field photos, inventories, and authenticity reports changing hands along with the fossil, the actual object, the part that can still offer physical evidence, disappears from the public sphere. For scientists, that's the loss. A skull like this could yield new data for decades. Now it might sit behind closed doors, seen only by a handful of friends or clients. 
And so, Maximus, with its rare preservation and battle-scarred history, is no longer part of the shared record. Its secrets, whatever they are, now sit in a collection no one outside the buyer's circle can access. Which leaves one question hanging in the air. What happens next? Maximus wasn't just another fossil dug out of the Hell Creek Formation. It was a nearly unmatched record of one animal's life, injuries, and survival. Evidence you can't reconstruct from photos or auction catalogs. Now it's out of reach, its potential to answer new questions effectively paused. We might never learn what its bones could still reveal unless the new owner chooses to share it. That's the decision point here. Should specimens like this be treated as private display pieces or as part of our collective heritage? Because once they're gone from public study, the loss isn't just academic, it's permanent. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.